thank you. Thank you for your a generous welcome in this uh, com compelling conference, um, especially to the organizers. And I hope we will have something sufficiently interesting to offer here at, at the end of a, a full second day of uh, fascinating presentations. Thank you for your patience with my uh, technical <laughs> technical situation. So we will uh, we begin in, in Ann Arbor. Um, the University of Michigan is privileged to be current custodians of a notable collection of manuscripts from various areas of the Islamic world, comprising more than 1,100 volumes that carry more than 1,800 texts in Arabic, Persian, and Turkish. The 265 manuscripts acquired in a purchase transacted with the noted Orientalist and manuscript collector, Abraham Shalom Yahuda, represent a significant portion of this collection and have truly defined it. While Yahuda's hand in shaping the holdings of a number of American and European libraries during the first several decades of the 20th century has already been recognized, the extent of his involvement in German collecting history is still being brought to light. Yehuda operated within a significant network of institutional, scholarly, and cultural interests, as well as economic and political. Leveraging his positionality, his academic appointments, his trade contacts, and other uh, connections to source, remove and place manuscripts in the collections of powerful and prestigious institutions. In this brief paper, Torsten and I would like to explore those interests and connections through the lens of Yehuda's role in placing manuscripts at the University of Michigan, as we find they lead us directly into German collecting context. I will begin by introducing Yehuda's offer to Michigan his approach to pitching a potential acquisition to the university and what ultimately made that offer compelling, and intersections with his broader manuscript sourcing and dealing of the 1920s in Germany in particular. This narrative sheds light not only on the contemporary network of trade and institutional collecting ambitions, but also on Yehuda's assessment of manuscript significance and what constitutes a quality collection, particularly for a would-be institutional buyer or collector. The narrative begins in the summer of 1925 when Yehuda approaches the British Museum with an offer of a collection of Arabic, Turkish, and Persian manuscripts. This prompts Edward Edwards of the museum's Department of Oriental printed books and manuscripts together to write University of Michigan professor Francis Wiley Kelsey, a respected classicist and archeologist who was actively expanding the university's holdings in antiquities, papyri and manuscripts, and who had apparently requested that Edwards keep him apprised of any such opportunities. Notably, Edwards introduces Yehuda as the brother of J.B. Yehuda of Cairo and indicates that the manuscripts listed by Yehuda are those his brother has for sale. Indeed, A.S. Yehuda's older brother, the scholar Yitzhak Benjamin Yehuda, was active as a dealer of books and manuscripts for many years in Darmstadt from roughly 1904 to 1906 and thereafter out of Cairo until around 1920 when he returned to Jerusalem. And during these years, even into the mid 1920s, he supplied institutions and individuals, including the British Museum, the New York Public Library, and Ignaz Golsiher, but also German institutions, as we will hear. In Cairo, he was well respected among local scholars and visiting Orientalists and published on Arabic literature. He had apparently also undertaken the preparation of a catalog of the books and manuscripts in his inventory which was surely the basis for the list, the slips shown by A.S. Yehuda. Also of note, Edwards indicates that Yehuda has supplied the British Museum with a substantial number of manuscripts over the course of several years. It is entirely unclear from Edwards phrasing here whether he refers to I.B. Uh, Yehuda or A.S. Yehuda, and this is perhaps unsurprising as they work together and uh, evidence of 
their their uh, involvement appears in the acquisition records under uh, each of their names. Um, they work closely. AS Yehuda often acting as a kind of agent or, or otherwise sourcing manuscripts from the dealer inventory, which was possibly even a shared inventory or in some way transferred to AS Yehuda at this point. A.S. Yehuda redirects his offer to the University of Michigan and writes to Kelsey from Heidelberg, where he was then based. In his letter of late July 1925, he launches in without preamble. I herewith beg to offer you a collection of manuscripts belonging to my brother, I.B. Yehuda, who was for many years a dealer in Oriental books and manuscripts in Cairo. He's careful to note that he has been advised to approach Kelsey in the matter by some colleagues in England and also by Dr. Edwards of the British Museum. Recognizing that the trusted endorsement of Edwards is particularly valuable, he goes on to reference Edwards' evaluation of the collection and the arrangements between him and Kelsey. As you have asked him to call your attention to any collection of which he may hear, he was good enough to look through the slips which I made of the manuscripts and to bring the matter to your notice. Yehuda again invokes the word of Edwards on matters of price, saying that while Edwards agreed that the price asked for is quite reasonable, he also suggested a slight reduction per manuscript down a shilling. However, Yehuda places the ultimate discretion on price with his brother and appeals to the complications imposed by local governments and the appetites of collectors for swelling prices, though he can be accommodating accepting payment in multiple installments. Quote, should you be prepared to buy the whole collection, I shall do my best to persuade my brother to make some reduction if possible on the total amount. I must, however, emphasize that as matters stand now, it is very difficult to get manuscripts at lower prices, as it was still possible some time ago. Now, not only are the governments in the Orient particularly vigilant in preventing valuable manuscripts from leaving their countries, but also private collectors are eager to acquire any manuscript they can get hold of, often paying much higher prices than any European or American library. Yehuda also emphasizes that the present offer of 230 manuscripts has been carefully selected by him from a much larger collection of manuscripts at his disposal, again, his brother's sales inventory, excluding those manuscripts of less value or those which are to be found in several libraries. The overall impression is that this is not only a tremendous deal from a reliable and discriminating source, but a remarkable opportunity, as such opportunities are only becoming even more scarce. To present the collection, Yehuda provides a five page enclosed summary and 230 slips sent under separate cover. And these are typical booksellers slips, which provide all the necessary details about the collection. Fortunately, these are now preserved with the manuscripts and their digital facsimiles and in the collection administrative files. And they reveal a number of manuscript features considered by Yehuda to be significant, um, as well as collection features. Again, what constitutes a, a quality collection? And presumably he is, of course, anticipating the interests of his would-be customers. The slips, which are, again, prepared in the main by A.S. Yehuda, range in coverage from minimal bibliographic detail, title, author, date of copying, page count, um, often in only transliteration, sometimes um, with the Arabic script. Also references to uh, biobibliographical sources, uh, such as Brockman uh, or Haji Khalifa, um, to a narrative description in, in German or in uh, English um, or even French, which uh, discuss the contents and their significance. Most details are in TypeScript, but notes uh, do appear, most often in the hand of A.S. Yehuda, again, naturally. Date, uh, rarity, uh, whether or not the work has been uh, published, and even value statements such as, quote, a very valuable copy are emphasized along with the inventory number, uh, beginning with either I.L. or M for the collective volumes anthologies, the majmuas. The inventory numbers are also inscribed on the volumes. Most volumes also have an inscription with page count and an indication of the titles of the works, uh, frequently in what appears to be the hand actually of I.B. Yehuda. 
Well, the slips almost certainly, again, reflect this inventory catalog which he prepared. And some seem to have been drawn up by him before the final edits from his brother. They were likely custom prepared to suit particular offers and buyers, and then, of course, reused as, as needed. The slips are referenced in the summary description of the collection of Arabic manuscripts, almost certainly prepared by A.S. Yehuda, which points to their utility for cataloging, physical inventory, examination, and valuation, which is no small labor for um, any institution considering the acquisition. Further, the summary description suggests a number of significant features, early dating, uh, proximity to the author, uh, rarity, and presence of annotations by famous scholars, uh, specifically Sama'at wa Ijazat. Um, collection coverage in breadth of subjects and authors it represented is also presented as a strength, as is the importance of consulting manuscripts, even when printed editions might already be available, since those are, quote, full of mistakes, omissions, even alterations. Yehuda's offer is willingly entertained by the university with an understanding that the list of manuscripts must be checked against existing holdings. In the ensuing review, the selection is found to admirably supplement the existing collection, though with some so-called duplicates. After uh, settling a reduction in the price, Yehuda comes down to 5,500 uh, US dollars, which is roughly equivalent to 85,000 euro uh, today, uh, still a substantial sum for the university. And also a an agreement on replacement of those duplicates the first batch of manuscripts finally reaches Ann Arbor in the fall of 1926, more than a year after the initial offer. And this is just the first batch. Um, the allure of Yehuda's offer is clear, an opportunity to purchase an entire collection, already carefully catalogued, carefully formed, carefully constructed um, of notable content um, with unique and rare items of greatest interest to Orientalists, quote. Um, a great variety of subjects, not duplicating manuscripts already held, early copies with potential for study and especially for path-breaking publication. And this rides on the momentum of major manuscript purchases just uh, by the university just a year prior. Ultimately, Yehuda's offer successfully appeals to the university's collecting ambitions, which are sizable collections, engaging certain Orientalist scholars in authoritative publication of, of documents uh, by so-called competent hands, um, and motivation for the prestige of ownership um, without significant regard to the dispossession or displacement necessary to sort the, uh, source the manuscripts, not to mention uh, disregard for the contributions of scholars in, in the region. In the midst of uh, the negotiation around Yehuda's offer, a number of anecdotes related to his wider manuscript sourcing and dealing beyond those dealings with the British Museum emerge. And now we move to, to Germany. <laughs> Many weeks uh, actually pass before the university can initially confirm interest and Yehuda is, a, is compelled to beg a decision as an opportunity to sell manuscripts to a German library has opened for him and he is quite uh, transparent about this in his exchange with uh, with the university. In late November, he writes, since my letter to you of November the 2nd, I was requested by a German library to submit to them a collection of Arabic manuscripts for purchase. I therefore see myself compelled to write again to you and beg you to let me know your, de your decision unless you have already done so in reply to my last letter, as I should not like to submit a list to them before I know exactly what number you are taking and which manuscripts you would like to have in place of those you don't need. As already noted, further along in the negotiation, Yehuda agrees to reduce the price owing to the university's willingness to purchase the entire collection. At this stage, Yehuda makes no pretense of deferring to his brother, consulting his brother in the payment negotiations. He just proceeds. When the prospect of replacing those duplicate manuscripts is put forward, again, he indicates he's quite willing to accommodate replacements since he can include them in the remaining manuscripts which he is about to offer to a German library. And as it turns out, uh, slips for the four rejected manuscripts have been retained in our administrative files. Analyzing these with respect to the current holdings at Heidelberg University Library, 
reveals that this German library must have been Heidelberg. One of those rejected, which you see in the slip at the top for a copy of Rumi's Masnavi, um, IL314A uh, mark, is now manuscript number 153 in Heidelberg University Library. So now let us hear further on these German ties and uh, Yehuda's motivations from our colleague uh, Torsten. Thank you, Evan. Um, yeah, this is the groundwork, and uh, whereas um, Yehuda certainly served as an architect of the collection in Michigan, in these uh, German collections that I will talk about, he is more an agent than an architect. So, in the remaining minutes, I want to, uh, or we want to look um, at the question how Yehuda influenced the growth of manuscripts collections in Germany. Uh, he himself was um, like a product of the German um, university system, uh, a graduate of the university in Strasbourg, but also had studied at several other universities, as you can now even read in his German Wikipedia entry. Um, he also served as faculty at uh, the Higher Institute for the, so it's the, um, Institute for the Wissenschaft der, uh, des Judentums uh, in, in Berlin, so the Higher Institute of uh, yeah, uh, Research on uh, Judaism, which is not existent anymore. Um, and it stands to reason that, you know, um, as he spent a considerable time of his life in Germany, he would also have sold manuscripts to German collections. Um, Can we switch to my, is that mine? Yeah, great. So the first collection is Heidelberg University, as uh, Evan has already said. And uh, this university library received around 120 manuscripts from Yehuda as gifts in exchange for other books or um, through purchase in the years 1925 to 1929. Um, is that already the one? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, sorry about that. Um, this information, like the, the provenance of, like the Yehuda provenance, uh, can be traced through a number of sources, accession numbers, and other uh, annotations in the manuscripts themselves, as well as remarks in the different catalogs. Um, and hand lists uh, that uh, librarians in Heidelberg have provided. And as you can see on the uh, right, in the Be printed Berenbach catalog, um, he cites uh, Yehuda himself. Um, and you can see the, uh, the Yehuda um, provenance noted in the hand list on the bottom as well. So, yeah. So, Whereas Yehuda sold to Michigan in bulk, he supplied the University Library in Heidelberg with manuscripts over a period of these several years. Allegedly, there were plans of selling his entire Oriental Library, this is a term that is used in the sources, to Heidelberg in 1929, but because of the uh, Black Friday uh, financial crisis, those plans came to nothing. And for this is maybe we should uh, talk a little bit about the background. So after the First World War, um, like a collector or like a, a manuscript trader such as Yehuda uh, would not have sold to a German library because German um, currency was devalued and German institutional libraries didn't have the funds to purchase Arabic manuscripts in the early post-war years. Um, this might actually have been one incentive for Yehuda to reach out to potential buyers such as the British Museum or, Michi or the University Library in Michigan. However, then by 1924, the situation changed with the currency reform and especially then with the establishment of the Notgemeinschaft der Deutschen Wissenschaft, a predecessor of the German Research Council today. Um, and uh, in Heidelberg, there are a couple of uh, especially printed books, but also some manuscripts not ones that were bought from Yehuda, as far as I can say, that have um, a book stamp in the beginning, uh, noting that they were bought with money from this institution. However, most of these purchases were on a, were on a much smaller scale than the 
purchase uh, uh, the then Yehuda sale to Michigan. So, but why did sell, uh, why did Yehuda sell manuscripts to Heidelberg of all places? So a hint was given, sorry, a hint was given already by Evan's uh, presentation because he had an address in Heidelberg, right? Um, he was like throughout most of the 1920s, he was living in the Bergstraße 55, uh, 55 sorry, um, a Jugendstil villa in a very good part of town. And uh, I don't have that in my presentation, but if you search for this address on the internet, you uh, actually, like uh, this villa is being restored at the moment and there are um, images of the uh, outside and interior available. This villa had 1,000 square meters and is uh, a very pretty building. So this is where he's staying, right, um, at the time. But why is he there? Uh, Yehuda, as was said earlier, uh, was in Berlin before the First World War and then moved to Madrid um, in 1913, I believe, uh, to um, accept a chair of uh, Jewish and rabbinic literature and languages. Um, and then had plans to uh, go to Hebrew, the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, which then came to nothing. So in the 1920s, we find him in Heidelberg. Um, for this, it needs to be emphasized that Yehuda was not only a dealer of manuscript, but also an Orientalist uh, with his own research interests and, I guess, hopes for a stable university position. So after leaving Spain, he came to Heidelberg in late 1922 to work on his book on the uh, language of the Pentateuch, which was then published in 1929 in German and later was republished in English as well. Um, Yehuda had spent only one year during his studies in Heidelberg, uh, but there he reunited uh, with several familiar faces from his alma mater in Strasbourg. Among them were, yeah, among them, uh, were Arabists, Semitists and Egyptologists. The Egyptologist uh, Wilhelm Spiegelberg Borg, uh, had come to Heidelberg in 1919 um, and he would write a damning review on Yehuda's book in 1929. Then we see uh, the Semitist Gotthold Bergstresser, he was also a reviewer of Yehuda and um, he was a person that brought actually uh, books from Oskar Rescher to Heidelberg um, during his time there. Um, and then the most tangible contract contact is between Yehuda and Henny von Halle, about whom, like, of whom I could not find an image. Uh, this was established by another Egyptologist, Adolf Hermann in, Bel in Berlin. You see the network stake extend beyond Heidelberg. Um, and von Halle transcribed hieroglyphic text for Yehuda's book. So they would, um, yeah. So in addition, Heidelberg stood out among German universities in its liberal attitude towards uh, Jewish students as well as faculty. And according to a letter uh, Yehuda sent to Dr. Barnett at the British Museum in 1923, and I quote, the general conditions in this country are not very favorable, but here in the atmosphere of the university, we feel very little of it, end of quote. Um, so I guess this might be one of the reasons why uh, Yehuda is found in Heidelberg in the 1920s. And he might even have hope for uh, a professorship there. And so like the early gifts of manuscripts in 1925 and in 1926 that he gave to the uh, university library might have to do with hopes of joining the faculty. This position never materialized, however, um, and Yehuda left Heidelberg in 1930. During this period, uh, he seems to have leaned ever more heavily on the manuscript trade to earn his livelihood, selling first to Michigan and later to uh, the industrialist Chester Beatty in bulk. Um, yeah, and as in the sale in Mich uh, to Michigan, there are strong indications that um, large parts of the Yehuda manuscripts in Heidelberg had once been in the hands or in the inventory of his brother as well. So you see on the right an example for, from Michigan with uh, certain annotations, like there is the M number for a Majmua, uh, there are similar numbers 
to be found in manuscripts in Heidelberg. Sometimes he uses these little stamps to, um, to add these numbers. And also here I have other, uh, sort of, another sort of annotation, um, titles and other uh, bibliographical information in blue ink, and then um, page numbers um, penciled on, the top, uh, on, the, on one of the early fly leaves usually. Um, and these different annotations allow us to trace manuscripts back to the Yehuda complex uh, that don't have, like for which we don't have uh, clear provenance records in uh, Heidelberg University Library so far. So with that, I'll come to the second collection uh, to which he sold in uh, Germany. And this is the Berlin State Library. Again, we find him as an agent and not as an architect of a collection, obviously. Um, we find here uh, a similar pattern, uh, or we find a somewhat similar pattern as in Heidelberg, also in an earlier period of Yehuda's life and career. Having completed his PhD in 1904, he had to move to Berlin by 1906, or some say 1905, uh, where he would work at the Higher Institute for Jewish Studies until 1914. I'll jump one slide now. So what we can see here are the different addresses that he has in his times during uh, Berlin. The, this data is taken from the Journal of the um, German Oriental Society. Uh, you see on the far left uh, the address of, like his work address um, at the uh, Higher Institute of, uh, um, yeah, the research on Higher Institute for Jewish Studies. Sorry for that. Uh, and then you see a number of different addresses uh, on the left in the very good part of town uh, Charlottenburg, although one of them is uh, just over in Moabit. And these are the addresses where we find Yehuda in his uh, early uh, post-dissertation uh, days. And these uh, addresses mostly match up with addresses that we find in the accession journals about which we have heard from Lawrence Kern. Um, today. So from those we also learn the number of manuscripts that uh, both the Yehuda sold um, and the price the State Library paid for those manuscripts. Um, and we find actually they are, like these, these, uh, these sales or purchases are ascribed to one Yehuda or the other. So we have a very clear provenance record here Certain manuscripts are counted as coming from J.B. Yehuda and others are counted as coming from A.S. Yehuda. But here I'll take them together for reasons like from the, the larger picture is that these people, uh, that these brothers work together in these manners. Okay, great. So uh, let's look at what they earn from these sales. So uh, A.S. Yehuda gets between 48 and 420 German mark per manuscript, coming to a total of more than 5,600 mark. Uh, to put this sum in pers into perspective, today this would be between 32 and 38,000 euro. So for these, for, um, for overall um, some 40 manuscripts together. Uh, his brother, um, so I, I guess that he also, like that Yehuda also um, served as an agent in his brother's bulk sale of 70 manuscripts in 1913, coming directly from Cairo. Um, those uh, manuscripts uh, would cost 228 mark 50 per manuscript. Um, and overall this sale uh, would have earned um, J.B. Yehuda, 100,000 euro. But as I said, his brother served as an agent in this respect and he would probably have, uh, would have gotten a cut from that as well. So, just jump back here. So, uh, what we can see here um, with these uh, manuscripts is that even at this early stage of working in the manuscript um, trade, uh, we find these, uh, some of these bibliographical annotations that later appear in Michigan and in Heidelberg as well. 
um, and especially in the 1930 bulk sale, we find these. So you can see that uh, the page numbers are given on the first page, like on the left. Uh, this is a this is a biographical dictionary, uh, and with which lacks the title page. So you find the mark, uh, you find uh, the page numbers noted on the uh, first fo uh, folio, and on the right side, a hadith collection. You find it below the title statements, together with a penciled um, descriptive title of that work. Um, yeah. Uh, however, not all of A.S. Yahuda's manuscripts that come to uh, Berlin show these annotations, especially the early sales of Hebrew and Samaritan manuscripts he sold to Berlin lacked those. This indicates that those annotations were made, like I argue, were made in uh, J.B. Yahuda's bookstore or inventory that those are made by, not by, an, like by uh, the academic brother, but by the, by the antiquarian brother, so to say. And although the Yehudas had far less impact on the makeup of the collections in Berlin and Heidelberg than that in Michigan, um, jointly, these, uh, these different traces they left in, um, in the form of correspondences, in accession journals, as well as in the manuscripts themselves, allow for glimpses into how collectors operated and how they searched for customers in an increasingly global marketplace. Thank you. Thank you.